We tried to introduce uh, our distinguished guest tonight would be purely to gild the lily. And I won't attempt any such thing as that. Uh, frankly, all of you must know of him. Uh, and the size of the crowd attests to that. Uh, without any further uh, of my gravelly voice into this microphone, I'd like to have Dr. A.M. Gibson of the uh, History Department of Gibson of the uh, History Department of the University of Oklahoma talk to us. Thank you, Leon, for that merciful <laughs> presentation. <clears throat> All the way over here, I was thinking of what I could say to show the gratitude and the deep sense of honor that I feel for being permitted to return. You remember, perhaps, that I had the, uh, the, the great honor of appearing before this group about two years ago. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a matter of some pride that, that I am asked back. And I was thinking what I might say to share with you how grateful I feel. And I thought, well, among other things, I can tell them from my heart that uh, Tahlequah, it's great to be back in Tahlequah because uh, it's my favorite town in Oklahoma. But then when I walked in the door, in order that I might not be to save myself from being regarded as a black-hearted ingrate and scoundrel, and remembering the many honors and kindnesses extended to me by my dear friends in Muskogee, I must amend that statement <laughs> and say that, uh, well, I've had some great times in Muskogee, too. <clears throat> but it is great to be back with old friends, and I look forward to making new friends. Tonight, uh, in as much as uh, the West is a product of many things, largely the sacrifice and devotion of Eve's daughters. I would like to try to present tonight a sort of uh, word tribute to the pioneer woman, and I call it a day in the life of the pioneer woman. Patrick Hurley, one of Oklahoma's most famous native son was asked to speak on the dedication of the unveiling of the monument of the pioneer woman at Ponca City on April the 22nd, 1930. Pat always made a good speech. On this occasion, speaking as the Secretary of War in President Hoover's cabinet, he was at his best. Some of his comments on this memorable day were that the pioneer woman has held the objectives gained by men. She has been the bulwark ever standing between civilization and barbarism. The pioneer woman has played her part in the conquest of nature through all the ages. She has been with her man and her family in their struggles with the wilderness and the desert places of the world. The story of her struggles in the, in, with the wilderness and the desert places, her sacrifices, her pains, and her sorrows is lost in the passing of the years. The nameless grave of the pioneer woman is by every stream, on every plain and mountain, from north to south, east to west, in this great land. The hardships to which the men were subjected during the first years of occupancy of Oklahoma were very great. Those to which the pioneer women were subjected were pitiful. We like to picture our pioneer father as a stalwart man armed with good weapons marching out into a country where the chances for success <clears throat> were not equal to the dangers to be encountered. We admire him for his strength and his unfailing courage. But the real fortitude of that expedition was in the heart of the woman who marched by his side. I fancy, Pat says, that I see her now, her smiling face encircled by a sunbonnet, 
When she was young, brave, her heart was full of hope, and she was beautiful in her own way. It was she who fortified the humble home, the cabin or dugout, with her character. It was she who went down into the valley of the shadow of death to bring forth the sturdy sons and daughters of the pioneers. It was she who stayed when all others were anxious to leave. It was the pioneer woman and not the pioneer man who conquered the frontier. Well, Pat Hurley's tribute to the pioneer woman is really the recognition of the cumulative impact of the thousands of Eve's daughters who came to this wilderness, who loved, who worked, endured and suffered, and who built. My address is an attempt to extend this richly deserved tribute and to personalize the pioneer woman. I shall try this evening to provide an intimate look at the pioneer woman by, by vicariously spending the day with her, and through this, gain an even deeper appreciation of the mainspring of the pioneer heritage she so graciously bestowed, of the direction and character she provides for our way of life. To provide this intimate look at a day in the life of the pioneer woman, I've drawn on many sources. Most of these are the humble diaries, the letters, the occasional memoirs created by the pioneer woman. Actually, she was so busy that some of these come from grateful children who grew up about her skirts in the household. <clears throat> these sources show that the pioneer woman, as the epitome of those thousands of mothers who came to this new land, could have come from the north, from the south, east, and a few from the west. But wherever her origin, she left comforts and security for a new opportunity for her men and her children. And if she missed her old home and family ties, her poise, her spunk, seldom permitted her to admit it. She did bring with her the best of her old surroundings. These included memories of schools, the church, character. And it was her initiative which was most responsible for establishing and civilizing forces in the new land. Few were the pioneer men who could make it without the aid and encouragement of these women. In many cases, husbands and wives came together to this new land. Often, a young man homesteaded, developed his claim, then went back to find his helpmates. It was not unusual to find a notice packed on a settler's cabin door with the simple notice warning away claim jumpers with this statement gone to get a wife. <laughs> the scattered claims made it a lonely life, particularly for the women. One woman in recalling early homestead days in this country exclaimed, it, de it did indeed seem so good to see the women coming in. Although the toil, fear, and dangers, these were disagreeable, the loneliness, this was the most depressing. As the days and weeks passed, the homesteader woman hungered for an opportunity to exchange thought and speech with one of her own sex. One pioneer mother lived in a claim so isolated that she did not see another woman for over a year. Hearing that at last one had come to live on a claim some miles away, she determined to go see her. Setting out early one morning, accompanied by her two little children, she walked several miles. At last she reached the other's cabin door, and joy, joy inexpressible, there stood one like herself. They were utter strangers, neither knowing the other's name. But they threw their arms about each other, and they wept, then laughed, and they wept again. The pioneer woman's frontier home was a log cabin, sometimes of the picket wall construction, the timber was on the claim. Much of central and western Oklahoma territory primarily was grassland, and the absence of heavy timber forced the homesteaders to use the material available, so sod houses were common. 
The dugout, a sort of a split-level cellar dwelling, often was the first home in this wilderness. A ridge pole supported by frame or log construction at the front carried the roof, which was often thatched, limbs covered with dirt and sod. The pioneer woman worked and saved for the day that her man could build her a two-room frame nester house. But until this was possible, she demonstrated amazing resourcefulness and creative talent. In her long day that ran from before sunrise to well after dark, she saved some time for rug making. Carpets for the pioneer homes were made from old worn out clothing. Narrow strips of this clothing were sewed together and rolled into balls about six or seven inches in diameter. Floor coverings often required over 30 balls of this material. Some women hooked the rugs into a circular form, and a few had hand looms and produced woven rugs. They placed straw on the floor for padding, and one pioneer woman recalled it. When finally laid, <clears throat> one had a floor gorgeous to walk across and a covering that would last for years. In the dugouts and the sod houses, Dirt floor, dirt sifted through onto the floor, on the beds and other furniture, and heavy rains leaked through with the dirt and muddied the interiors. Insects and varmints of all sorts took up residence in the walls of the sod houses and the dugouts. Many a pioneer mother killed tarantulas in her baby's crib. A regular occurrence was a snake's head suddenly protruding from a sod wall or his slithery length seemed coiled around a rafter. Early Oklahoma homemakers found large fleas the greatest nuisance. One woman said you could not keep them out of the dugouts. I have had my whole floor covered with devil's claw trying to keep fleas off the bed. A devil claw is a kind of a sticky plant, she explains, that grows on the prairie that fleas like to get on and they claim once on a devil's claw a flea can get loose from the sticky substance that binds their legs to the plant. Well, in the single room dugout or sod house, the center of the household was the stove. General lack of wood made the typical frontier fireplace scarce. Many settlers, of course, brought cook stoves to the new land. Seldom did, did these throw out enough heat, as the pioneers would say, so the woman turned to the bachelor stove with a drum and a pipe for cooking. It warmed the house, women said, and it baked just as well as an oven in a cook, in a cook stove. With wood generally scarce, fuel was a problem, and cow chips were commonly used. Of course, we're speaking of central and western Oklahoma, not the heavily forested, scenic, wondrous, beautiful country <laughs> of eastern Oklahoma. <laughs> but out in that part of the wilderness, wood was generally scarce, fuel was a problem, cow chips were commonly used, and a chore for children was to go across the prairie with a gunny sack gathering couches. An interesting talent of the pioneer woman was her business sense. One mother saved for years to raise $24 cash to buy a cow with a new calf so her children would have fresh milk. She developed a nice herd from this start, the single original cow producing through the years 18 heifer cows. Another pioneer woman received 20 cents in cash in a letter from her mother back east with instructions to buy stamps with the money. So instead she took the 20 cents and bought calico and we let her tell the rest of the story. She said, I took that calico and made a pretty sunbonnet, which I sold to a neighbor for 40 cents. I got pretty speckled calico and kept making sunbonnets and selling them until I had enough money to buy a dozen hens. I paid 12 and a half cents a piece for the hens, and the woman I bought them from threw in a rooster. <coughs> I had lived in this dugout and made down beds on the floor for, for four years, and I began to wish for a house on top of the ground. I now had plenty of chickens, so I sold some and bought some turkey eggs. I raised 75 turkeys and sold them for a dollar apiece, netting me $75. My husband went to Quanta and bought lumber to build two rooms about the ground, above the ground, which he built just in front of the dugout. And I took my $75 and got me some furniture. Did I feel proud? <laughs> well, for 
For home furnishings, most of the pioneer women were not so fortunate. Furniture often was made from cottonwood blocks, and tables and chairs were homemade, as were the beds. Wooden frames with rawhide laced across the bottom to hold the leather or straw tick were common. Sheets, tablecloths, and undergarments were made from bleached flour sacks. Wallpaper and lace curtains were regarded as luxuries. Many families brought some furniture with them to the new land, and one homesteader family from Texas, because the mother and sister hauled in two bedsteads and three feather beds, a marble top bureau, six split bottom chairs, and a number eight wood cook stove. A daughter in this family recalled <coughs> that uh, our broom was made from broom weeds tied in a bunch. No one ever moved this broom as there was an old superstition that bad luck would follow if you did. But with all her other chore, chores, the pioneer mother also had to provide life for her humble frontier home. The better fixed pioneers had oil lamps, but most folks molded tallow candles. The better, the, the molds cast six at a time. A, a sign of emergence from poverty was the coal oil lamp, which gradually came to illuminate most frontier households. Life for the pioneer woman was made more difficult because of the water situation. The claim might have flowing springs or creeks, but distance from the dugout made frequent trips necessary. As her children grew to a size where they could help with the chores, this was one of the first assignments made. Wells were dug or drilled too, but the water from all the sources generally was impregnated with minerals. One daughter of the frontier recalled that the worst hardship of pioneering for her was the awful taste of the water which was saturated with gypsum. <coughs> It tasted even worse than the Epsom salts that we children are forced to down for almost any ailment. <laughs> and it had the same physicking effect, too. <laughs> Mother, Mother's worst tribulation came when she had to use this water for laundry purposes. Unless she had broken the water with a few spoonfuls of concentrated lye, the soap simply turned into floating curds, and it had absolutely no effect on the dirt and the clothes it washed. Mother wept over the drab appearance of her once once snowy white sheets and Phyllis lips, now and secretly resented ever coming to this terrible wilderness. All of this now dingy as a result of being washed in this awful water and dried in the dust-laden winds of western Oklahoma. The water also played havoc with our skin, this person says, especially our faces and hands, leaving them rough red, sometimes painfully sore to touch. <coughs> Thus, father or mother harangued father until he dug a cistern, plastered its walls uh, and bottom, and when it rained, water drained off the roof down a pipe through a sand and charcoal filter to purify it for drinking. Of course, the pioneer woman also caught the water in the rain barrel and saved it for washing certain fabrics and washing her daughter's hair. So the pioneer woman seemed to wage an eternal war on dirt and filth, and no matter how humble her household, it generally was neat and her children clean. Children seemed to detest wash day, for mother was cranky and determined, and not as patient as usual. Water was carried from the spring or creek and heated in the big black iron kettle. Wooden and later galvanized wash tubs held the hot, soapy water and rinse water. The entire family was mustered to help on wash day. This was before the scrub board, and one member of a pioneer family left his dread of wash day at the dugout. He said, <clears throat> Oh, how tired I grew on wash day, beating and pounding the clothes while mother washed them with her hands. And I well remember the battling stick used on wash day. The clothes would be taken out of the wooden tub and laid on a bench or block made for that purpose and beaten with one hand while the clothes were turned with the other. The battling stick was in the shape of a paddle, only heavier. Well, the pioneer woman made her own soap, too, and she saved ashes and threw them into a V-shaped hopper called a leech. Wood ashes were best, although corn stalk ashes were used uh, largely on the treeless plains. And while the ashes accumulated during the winter, the meat scraps were collected in another container, all kinds of fat, bacon rinds, scraps from the lard brines, the drippings of tallow and lard and bones, and and also marrow made excellent soap grease. 
And when the time came to make the soap, water was poured over the ashes and the leach and the liquid which soaked through the ashes was caught in a pail. For good soap, this brown liquid had to be strong enough to float an egg. The meat scraps were put into the large iron kettle and the potash added. And after several hours boiling, this formed a slippery mass called soft soap. After several hours boiling, <clears throat> this it was usually kept in this form, but in later years, by adding salt and continuing the boiling process, hard soap was made. Washing and bedding was the biggest cleaning operation on the homestead. And one pioneer recalls, we generally just washed quilts twice a year, in the spring and in the fall. Mother would soak the quilts in some of that lye and lots of water, or lye soap and water in large tubs, and we children would get in there with our bare feet and tramp out the dirt. <laughs> the pioneer woman's inventiveness was shown in her ability to feed her family with amazingly limited resources. She drew upon nature and season for wild game, salad greens, wild fruits like the sand plum and grapes fought an erratic climate for a garden and enriched the family diet with her flock of poultry and the milk cow. She dried fruit, canned fruits and vegetables and supervised the putting up of pork and beef products for winter. One Oklahoma resident who grew up on the state's western frontier recalled, my brothers went, a, went about twice a year for groceries and other necessities to El Reno, Oklahoma, our closest railroad town. They usually bought 100 pounds of sugar, 600 pounds of flour, 50 pounds of coffee, and a variety of dried fruits, 25 pounds. It would take a week to make these trips, and sometimes three weeks when the rivers were up. The Canadian River was bad when the water was high. Well, in hard times, the family fare might consist of tough prairie chickens and boiled calf or corn. And one settler recalled, we developed the polite art of spitting out the hose at the table. <laughs> well, resourceful pioneer women during hard times found coffee substitutes, which included parched rye and wheat, and even sweet potatoes. One wrote, we'd parch them right brown, grate them first, and sometimes parch corn and meal to make a substitute for coffee. We call this Lincoln coffee. Sometimes on Sunday, these are Democrats. Sometimes on... <clears throat> On Sunday mornings, we would have real coffee and biscuits. <clears throat> For dressing her family, the pioneer mother in early times spun the cloth and loomed it, both wool and cotton. She knew the secrets of color after spinning the thread, and she dyed it different colors from dyes made of oak, bark, indigo, walnut holes. And one woman remembered, there was a bloom that grew on the prairie. I've forgotten the name of it but it dyed red if set with soap soap. Red oak bark set with copperas dyed black. Copperas <coughs> in the dye solution kept the cloth from fading. A social leader in Oklahoma City recalls, Mother always made our clothes by hand and taught all of us girls to sew. We wore corsets and buses, bustles, <laughs> and high top shoes either laced or buttoned. I wore red flannel underwear in the wintertime until I was seven years old. If we wore a thin dress, we wore four, wore four to six petticoats and always cotton hose. Our dresses were made basque style, whatever that is, with stays on each seam. Well, speaking of clothes, one pioneer recalled, I was grown before I ever saw a woman wear a hat. An uncle of mine got a hat, a white bibbed apron, and a corset for his daughter to be married in. And that corset made the rounds of the whole neighborhood for each bride to be married in for 10 years. <laughs> All the girls in the county wanted to be married in that corset. So it borrowed it, borrowed to be married in. Aunt Lindy said one did not need to have a white apron to be married in, but Uncle Blue White said his daughter had to be a little different. So she had to put on her apron over the wedding dress. We always had big dinners at these weddings, he said. We sent invitations by word of mouth and seldom was any friend left out. But of course, there were always feuds between families that you had to remember and not invite enemies to the same family affair. Well, concerning the pioneer woman's attire, she went on to say, everyone wore sunbonnets to church and everywhere. 
We were taught it was a sin of vanity to wear a hat. A glutton, one who always ate who her husband promoted the local public school. The pine picket wall structure, much like the homes of the district. Often through the initiative of the pioneer woman, uh, church conferences sent circuit rider clergy and evangelists to their frontier for protracted meetings. These men converted the community, drove out the devil, and organized a church. Well, the pioneer woman who had worked for years to establish a local church happily wrote, we had a protracted meeting on a lot of conversions and baptizings. We had to baptize in buffalo wallows anywhere we could find water deep enough. One of the first Im improvings we did was to dig a well 48 feet deep. We got abundance of water, and it was not long before people began to camp near this well, where it was about the only water in the whole region. Another pioneer woman who'd worked long and hard for a church reported, the spiritual harvest accomplished by the evangelists sent out to the frontier at her urging. And she says, I've gone to a baptizing when the candidates would all take hands and wade out into the stream together. The preacher would go down the line, ducking them under the water one at a time, and the whole line of a hundred or more would have to wait until the last one was, these are her words, ducked for the last prayer before they could wade out. When I was baptized, the ice had to be broken on the water for us to be dipped. I think there were about 40 baptized the day I was. The weather was so cold that as many as could pile in, into a hack were driven out into the water. We got out one at a time and were baptized singly. And as soon as one hack full was through, those who had been baptized were driven to the nearest house to change the dry clothes. Well, she saved her egg money to buy her heart's desire. So many pioneer women purchased organs. This drew company for community things. They were starved for company. Company so much desired. It provided an attraction for young people to come calling on her children. It made her humble cabin a social center. We have seen that the pioneer woman was resourceful, inventive, creative. She was versatile too. Doctors were rarely called to treat ailing family members. She did most of the doctoring. Her secrets for cures a blend of folk medicine and common sense. These brought amazing results. Plasters and poultices she made from linseed, mustard, and other preparations for boils and muscular disorders. Turpentine, camphor, boric acid, coal oil, and soda were common ingredients used by the pioneer woman in treating her family. A syrup made from whiskey and rock candy was regularly used for coughs. One pioneer mother has recorded her treatment for snake bite. Our little girl was bitten by a rattlesnake right by our front door, she says. I corded the leg and put the foot in a bucket of coal oil. The doctor from Beulah Land came and split the foot open four ways and let out the black clotted blood. The place was six months healing, and she crippled around for a year but finally got over it. She was wild out of her head for three days, though, and many people thought that the poison would affect her brain, but happily it did not. Well, through the pioneer woman, life was sustained and future generations assured to populate the frontier she and her husband tamed. She gave life and reciprocally assisted her sisters on the frontier at childbirth as a midwife. And she presided over the preparations the frontier community accorded those who departed this veil of tears. Her responsibility for laying out the dead was probably her sternest task and test. And her poise and initiative in these situations must have been amazing. One account of this phase of the life of the pioneer woman which I found tells of the death of the grandmother. The pioneer woman sent the men to the barn to make a coffin and a box to lay grandmother away. Neighbors began to arrive. The pioneer woman sent the women into the kitchen to make a dress suitable for her burial, and others into the bedroom to lay her out. They bathed her and combed her hair. They put coins 
in her eyes to hold them closed and tied a cloth around her chin to hold it up until the features were set. They covered her face and hands with cloths moistened in camphor to keep them white. When the new dress was ready, it was put on and she was placed in the new coffin. More neighbors came. These friends were coming to sit up with the family. The old body would not be left alone nor in the dark for an instant until it was laid lovingly in the box and put safely to rest underground. They spent the night in drinking much hot strong coffee and recounting old stories to keep themselves awake until the funeral possession could get started at dawn of the new day. If the pioneer woman had one weakness, <laughs> it was itinerant peddlers. <laughs> there were lightning rod salesmen, <laughs> notions drummers, but the fruit tree peddler gave her the most trouble. <laughs> These agents carried beautiful pictures of apples. You've seen them in catalogs. Plums, cherries, and other fruits. She longed for trees and fruit like that <clears throat> in her old home and was tempted to buy more than she could afford. The, ancients, the, the agent's commission was high and the trees frequently were a long time on the road. They arrived in poor condition and only a few of them lived. Oklahoma's pioneer woman, pain she suffered, greater pain by far. Sometimes this pioneer woman endured until she almost forgot how to suffer. From her joyous youth she toiled, and the bloom of that youth withered long before it passed. This they did, those silent ones, the women of the West. Lord, let that heart beat in their sons that counted patience best. God gave them courage measureless, and from heaven came their faith. White was their hope in the wilderness. Their love has conquered death. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Does someone have a question you'd like to ask the doctor before he sits down? <laughs> this is our last uh, meeting of the spring session, if you can call it that, of the posse. With this meeting, we will stand recessed until the last Friday in September. You're dismissed. Doctor? <laughs>